I identify as a systems thinker. Uh, it's a version of design thinking where basically you're able to take the what we call the zoomed out perspective and really, you know, rather than just focus on the, you know, the, the individual problems you want to solve, it's really about taking the overall as a system, how do we really produce these solutions and facilitate them. And so that's how really Seaworthy was born. But beyond that, we're not the only mechanism out there that's really looking at the grander scale of solving these problems. And so with us today, we have Courtney Carden from Blue Action Lab in the Bahamas and Neil Spackman from Regenerative Resources Company. We're really excited to have both of them. There's a lot of synergies. At the same time, you know, really just this diversity of ways that we can approach all the same problem of climate change and you know, ocean degradation. And so uh, I'm gonna have, have them each introduce themselves and we're gonna pull up a video for Neil. Courtney, do you wanna, you wanna start out giving just a little bit more on your background and, and, and Blue Action Lab? Yeah, happy to. Hi, um, I'm Courtney Carden. I am the Director of Business Development and Special Projects for the Blue Action Lab. Um, the Blue Action Lab is a place-based economic development initiative uh, designed to create an innovation hub in Freeport, Grand Bahama. So we are working on the identification, recruitment, and retention of green and blue entrepreneurs from around the world. And what makes us different is that it's a community-led initiative and we're really looking to identify organizations that are in the position to come and leverage the natural resources here in Freeport, Grand Bahama, as well as our local workforce um, and really create new businesses and economic opportunity for the people who live down here. So we're looking at um, everything that relies on sort of wind and solar, we have plenty of those, um, and then ways to do regenerative soil because we don't have plenty of that. And so we are um, really excited to be here today and, and uh, work with Seaworthy and to uh, talk about all of the things we're doing in Freeport, Grand Bahama. So thanks Daniel for having us. Hey all, I'm Neil, and uh, I'm from I'm founder and CEO of Regenerative Resources Corporation. Uh, my background is actually in desert work. I'm I'm known for being a desert guy, and for a project I ran in Saudi Arabia called the Albela Project, where we reversed 70 years of desertification in seven or eight years um, through the establishment of a silvopasture system. And after I left that project, I was intent on figuring out how to do ecological restoration and regeneration in a profitable way, which led me to Stanford. Um, did a master's in Stanford. And while I was there, I met my current partners at Regenerative Resources who have spent decades developing mangrove agroforestries and seawater agricultures. So that's what we're focused on at, at Regenerative Resources is, um, transforming degraded landscapes into productive ecosystems and using those to create circular regenerative economies. Yeah, and you know, I pulled up the video if, if you're ready to so share it. We're, we're sharing with you a four minute video that's an introduction to projects we're about to launch um, as, a, as an example of the kind of work we do. Yeah. Awesome, one second, there we are. You see my screen okay? There you go. La que de hace 40 años es muy diferente. We may be having sound <laughs> issues there, Daniel. We we should just send people the link and skip it for now. That sounds good. I'll, I'll, I'll get that to you. Are you me? Yeah, I'll I'll share the link in the chat and everyone can watch it on on their time. That's fine. Um, but yeah, Neil, do you want to just talk about what the what the project is? Neil, you're on mute. You're muted, Neil. Yeah, let's do it before the Q&A though, because I'll use it as a way to talk about what we're doing. Perfect, yeah, I'll put, I'll put the link in the chat and we'll, we'll, we'll do like a brief pause or something. Um, sorry about that guys, yeah, internet, streaming, streaming and Zoom are, are <laughs> difficult to do at the same time. Well, all that being said, you know, we're, the, both, of, both of these organizations work is just really, really fantastic for not only 
you know, what I like to say is democratizing the opportunity for impact, but really, again, also just the scale of impact that they're, they're each looking to make. And so when we, when we think about what the future of the oceans and, and climate impact is, right, these are the kinds of organizations that are actually going to lead facilitating these solutions and implementing them as well. And so basically what we're going to do today, we have a set of questions for, for our speakers already lined up. And then toward the end, we'll have a Q&A. So I just want to basically jump right in and then we'll, we'll go from there. We'll leave about 15 to 20 minutes toward the end for Q&A. So, but in the meantime, if you have questions, feel free to leave them in the chat. So with that, we're going to get started. Uh, first question I have for you guys is, how has your organization worked to democratize opportunities for ocean impact? Courtney, I'm going to throw it to you to start. Yeah, sounds great. Um, so as I said, you know, we are adhering to a community driven place based model. Um, and so we looked at the blue economy and saw a $2.3 trillion opportunity um, coming down the pike as so many others did. And what we didn't want to do was sort of give up and um, stand behind as, as Western countries who acknowledge the potential economic boon from the emerging blue economy took advantage of it. And so we decided to create a place-based model because we think that Freeport Grand Bahama is an ideal testing and proving ground. Um, it's proximity to Fort Lauderdale and US markets. We're 40 miles off the coast of Fort Lauderdale. Um, so we're close by, Daniel. Uh, but also our regulatory um, process is much less rigorous than the US regulatory process because as anyone knows, who's ventured into aquaculture in the US, you have local and state and federal and all sorts of regulatory issues when you're dealing with waters. Um, so one of the reasons that our anchor business, Coral Vita, a company that grows climate change resistant coral came and located in Freeport was because again, proximity to US markets, but also the ability to get really permissive, generous permits to do what they wanted to do, which was touch corals, um, collect coral fragments and, it, and use their micro fragmenting technology to grow climate change resistant coral. So we are offering sort of a more permissive um, opportunity for people who want to do aquaculture. We have an incredible drop off just a mile offshore, which is ideal for aquaculture farming for a number of different ways. Um, so we really wanted to make this proving ground accessible to entrepreneurs from around the world. We also wanted to give Western countries who have acknowledged that it's really important to to empower low-lying and coastal islands that are on the front lines of climate change, um, a place to essentially put their money where their mouths are. So we wanted to basically say, okay, you guys are talking about, you know, how important it is to create inclusive models and to empower these coastal communities that are going to be dealing with um, climate change first first before it hit other Western countries. So give us the resources, help us grow this community where we can actually use our proving ground um, to test and develop new technologies that will help communities not only um, survive severe weather systems caused by climate change, but really thrive in the face of a changing climate. So um, that's that's pretty much our inclusive model. Love it. And you know, I, I love the expression like does innovation drive policy or policy drive innovation. And these days we don't have time for policy to uh, come around. So it's really, really cool to see how you guys are flipping the script on that. Um, Neil, how about, how about you? Same question. So this is, this is a really interesting question because the bulk of our work is happening outside of the US. Um, and we are working with tribes or with fishing villages. Oftentimes it's with communities where, uh, these communities are oftentimes the cause of ecological degradation, but they're also the best hope for ecological re restoration. And so we're, I wouldn't really call it democratizing, but the vast majority of our work is in the global south. Um, and oftentimes it's, it's bringing resources from outside and then marrying solutions that people know that they have and problems that they know that they have and providing the resources and the structure necessary to, to implement solutions that generally local people already know that they've got. Um, but the products coming off of our systems and the, the opportunities, you know, there are a lot of people that live on coast, but most people don't. And um, one way that we're going to make this available to everybody to participate in is through the consumption of our goods. You know, we'll have the world's first regenerative shrimp to market probably by early 2023 or mid 2023. 
And the way we're producing this is um, our, our aquacultures grow forests. Um, and then we sell the products, right? And so if it's a, a virtuous consumption that we're establishing where if somebody eats our food, they're actually participating in reforestation and carbon sequestration and increases in water resources and increases in biodiversity just by buying our stuff. Um, that's kind of the magic of, of the regenerative concept and it's hard to pull off and hard to verify, but that is one thing that we're gonna offer anybody where the more you eat, the better it is for earth. Um, the other piece of it, I think, is that we'll be, um, we will be launching ways for people to contribute to this in, in nonprofit ways where um, we're setting up systems that allow us to accept Bitcoin or stock or real estate or cash as donations. And then these go directly into reforestation projects. So on the front end with the finance, everyone can contribute. That's already the case with all sorts of NGOs, but on the product side as well, um, buying our products will be a tantamount to participating in a solution to big problem. Yeah, no, it's, it's really interesting, you know, as far as just the different mechanisms to support it. Um, I think first off, just the indigenous wisdom piece is really interesting because, you know, a lot of people like to futurist, the futurist approach to problems. And the reality is that so much of the problems we're trying to solve are rooted in just getting back to basics and, you know, civilizations that have literally known how to have a minimal carbon footprint for quite some time. Um, so it's, it's really great that you can, you know, leverage and empower those communities and at the same time bring in, uh, you know, new and evolving funding mechanisms. And I'm sure we'll, we'll dive in deeper to that. Um, which I'm still wrapping my head around personally. Moving on though, uh, what are some of the systemic roadblocks to ocean and climate impact work that your organization is working to solve? Courtney, I'm gonna throw it back to you. Um, I would, thanks Daniel. Uh, this, is a, this is an interesting question that I um, think about a lot, um, particularly because you and I share sort of a systems thinking approach and I am a recovering policy wonk. I worked in democratic politics for a number of years um, and then realized um, similar to uh, you, Daniel, like, you know, there, there's a lot we can do in the private sector as well to sort of speed up things that maybe aren't going as quickly um, in the public sector as we would like. So I would say one of those systemic roadblocks is sort of the policy making process, which is designed to be slow. And I, I don't necessarily think it needs to go faster, but I do think um, that is a roadblock. I think we're seeing tremendous strides um, with this administration that I don't know would necessarily have even been possible had we not had the previous administration putting up additional roadblocks in the way. Um, I would say the climate community um, in, a, in very similar to the wider progressive community can also be its own worst enemy in a number of ways. Um, there is a scarcity of resources and many of these efforts, you know, it comes down to uh, funding and there's not enough funding or there's not enough alignment. I'm hopeful that as we move towards more progressive policies on climate and as the Biden administration makes climate um, a central piece of their policy and um, plan going forward, we will be able to get more resources because of the ways that policies work and because there will be incentives to invest in renewables, to invest in clean tech and to invest in innovation more broadly. And along that side, the effort to create more blue and green tech innovation opportunities like the Blue Action Lab. Um, I think those are those are the big systemic roadblocks, um, and but I think we're we're working hard to sort of change people's minds and perspectives about what investing is overall, what types of returns we should expect, and what it means to create value. So you know we all live on this planet; we should be incentivized to protect it, um, and there should be a system that incentivizes that, and you should be rewarded for investing in the protection of your home planet. So hopefully, as we change that sort of understanding. Um, there will, you know, our systems will follow along and, and reward better behavior, but um, I'm an optimist at heart, so we'll see. Well, and, and there's also emerging economic models happening too. Um, for anyone who hasn't heard, there's something called the don donut economics, and it's basically, it's hard to explain complex ex economic theory in, in basics, but it's, you know, basically the border of what is actually sustainable versus what's the minimum society has to have to function. And really, you know, when we talk about what these evolving economies look like, right? I mean, it's very much uh, this this ability to uh, to really enable these developing models. 
Um, and then otherwise, and it's not just theoretical. What was that? Sorry, it's not just theoretical. Kate Worth, Kate Rayworth, Donut Economics architect. Um, Amsterdam has adopted the donut economics model, and Curacao is actually going to be the first Caribbean country to adopt it as well. So the idea is essentially how can you not incentivize growth for growth's sake, but create a system that um incentivizes growth to the extent that we can meet all of the human needs like maslow's hierarchy and needs of people on the planet without exceeding our planetary boundaries and polluting the environment so can you live harmoniously in that donut and amsterdam and curacao are, are very much leading the way on that so yes love donut economics check out kate rayworth she's at oxford she's amazing Yes, and, and I love donuts, so they had me at that. Uh, <laughs> Neil, uh, so I, I'm getting, gonna get back to you. So uh, uh, again, what are some of these systemic roadblocks um, in, in your experience? Yeah, I think for us, the biggest one that we're addressing is poverty and functioning economies. Uh, the way that most economies function is they're extractive and destructive one way or another. Um, and then if you say, well, we need to stop this extraction or this destruction, then the, the immediate question is, well, what are we going to do instead, right? How are we going to take care of our communities? How are we going to take care of ourselves? And I'll, I'll, share, a, I'll share an example. Um, this is a set of communities we're working with in Mexico in a region called Laguna San Ignacio. And this is a UNESCO biosphere and a whale sanctuary. Um, the Pacific gray whales come to CAV here every year. And there's about 4,000 people living here and they're all, they're all fishing villages with the exception of Patrocinio up there, which that they're primarily grazing folks. They're, they're pastoral, so to speak. And in this area, the catch of the fishery has decreased by about 90%, right? So they're facing a collapse of the fishery um, facing deep poverty and the youth are leaving because they don't see any opportunities. And so these communities are really, they're breaking down. Um, and when you have poverty adjacent to conservation, as we do here, the conservation comes under direct threat, right? The conservation collapses because people look at these areas of conservation as re a place of resources that can be extracted, right? So Desertification, deforestation, aquifer depletion, fishery depletion, all of these things follow the same kind of pattern where uh, once a resource is depleted and the thing that our community relied on for the last 50 or 100 years is gone, you know, then you turn to these areas of conservation to be exploited. And so for us, it's about how do we create space that allows for an economy to function and these societies to function in a way that actually enhances the ecology of the place. Um, so for us, um, I'm, this is not intended to be shared, but in working with these communities, and we've, we've spent the last 18 months um, developing trust, figuring out what the real situation is, figuring out who the community leaders are, who has social capital, who has expertise that we can plug into the systems we're gonna build, but they know they know what's going on, right? And this is often the case in the communities that I've worked with, that they know the problem. They know that short-term needs, or, the, or rather that fulfilling short-term needs in a way that compromises long-term sustainability is bad, but they still don't have other ways to meet short-term needs, right? And so it, you get this cycle of degradation happening, right? And here Hadonimo says, we need development that's aligned with our ecosystem. Right? They recognize the problem. What they don't have are the resources and the wherewithal to institute the solutions. Um, so we're launching three different projects here. I'll mention two. Um, one is a reforestation on what's 8,000 hectares of islands in this laguna. We'll grow 12 million mangrove over the next four years. Um, and this will help to heal the fishery. It will create a much nicer place for the mama whales that come here to give birth, right? Just a nicer place for them. Um, and it will, through carbon crediting and some blue carbon schemes, it will fund the next reforestation project. Um, that's being led locally. And I don't wanna go into why mangroves are so awesome, 
But we have to also create an economy that allows these people to, to rest and to give their fishery rest, right? So this is a site we're working on. It's 500 hectares. Um, it's very, very saline landscape. Um, there's nothing growing there except for halophytes. And we're transforming it into this, um, which is kind of our bread and butter and a system that my partners developed over a number of decades. And what we're doing is we're using aquacultures and the effluent off of aquacultures to grow mangrove agroforestries in a circular seawater system, right? So we've got halophytic alley cropping here, which can be salicornia or portulacum or a couple other crops. We have mangrove woodlands and we have mangrove wetlands. And we produce about a dozen different things off of this system. But the short, the short version of this story is every single fisherman facing a collapse of the fishery, we can give them a job, right? We can absorb all of them, um, which means that we can give the fishery rest and let it recover while we regrow the mangrove forest on the 6,000 hectares. And then in the end, after three to five years, after a Jubilee period, we can work with these communities and with the Mexican authorities to reestablish that fishery as a commons, right? And so in the end, what you've got is a circular regenerative economy that is applicable to hundreds of thousands of hectares in the region, right? So that allows for the growth that we're talking about but this growth actually expands the donut. Um, th this is an economy that expands the donut because our, the impact of this is an increase in freshwater resources, an increase in biodiversity, millions of, millions of tons of carbon sequestered, and it's on land that's currently just saline and doesn't support life, right? So this is, this is a model of the sort of projects that we're doing. This is the one that we'll launch first. We're gonna launch this publicly in a, in a number of weeks. Um, and it, it's uh, something that we can do on between 15 and 20 million hectares globally. Um, there are communities like these in Mexico all over the planet, whether it's fishery collapse or deforestation or desertification or a loss of water resources. This, this approach and these kinds of systems can solve a whole bunch of problems at the same time. But for us, the, the barrier to getting to these kinds of things, it's poverty and it's lack of access to resources to institute these kinds of solutions. Awesome, thanks Neil. Yeah, all right, well, that made up for the video not working. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, all right, well, we're, we're gonna jump back in. Um, yeah, I think, I think you actually covered a lot of this next question. So I'll, I'll let you maybe continue with this uh, and then Courtney will come back to you, which is what are really some of the positive implications of overcoming these roadblocks? I mean, I think you, you pretty much mentioned it, but go ahead if you wanna, if there was anything else you wanted to add, Neil. No, let's, I wanna hear Courtney's answer to this. All right. <laughs> I too. wanted to hear you talk about how awesome mangroves are because as the director of special projects, we my two like community projects that I'm working on right now, one is um, waste management. So we're doing composting because there's, as I mentioned, not a lot of soil uh, here. The Bahamas are built on limestone and then beautiful white sand, um, but there's not a lot of really good sustainable soil. So um, organic compost. And the other one is mangrove restoration because in 2019, Hurricane Dorian came through and completely ravaged the island and it hit Grand Bahama and Abaco. Grand Bahama, while still very much devastated by the storm, was in way better shape than Abaco because it had both coral reefs surrounding it. Um, so shout out to Coral Vita again for all of their great work. And then it also had mangrove forests. Um, unfortunately, many of those mangrove forests we're doing what they're supposed to do in severe weather systems. So in addition to capturing all that carbon, they reduce a significant amount of wave energy and they protect island nations from severe weather systems. And so they did that, but because Hurricane Dorian was so massive and for a number of complicated scientific reasons, just parked itself over the Bahamas for two days, which is very unusual. Um, whole scale mangrove forests were lifted up from the coast and deposited inland. So there were parts of the of the forest that people, local Bahamians would drive by and they'd be like, I think that's from Dover Sound. So we are in the process now and Neil, we would love your help. We would love you to come down. Um, 
of actually building a mangrove restoration project um, with the local NGOs. So Save the Bays, Water Keepers, um, the Bahamas Bonefish and Tarpon Trust. Um, they're actually growing, uh, I think we have 10,000 mangrove propagules just around the corner from Daniel over in Florida that we're gonna pick up and, and plant. But part of that is very much the, the upskilling um, and the restoration and the and the workforce development that you just talked about, sort of um, enabling farmers to have new uh, economic development and revenue um, streams. So obviously, overcoming those systemic barriers, um, you know, it's it's one of the beauties of the private sector where you can really use innovation and the market to create new opportunities. And the idea of giving alternative economic revenue streams to island nations that are, are so wholly dependent on tourism and the demand from Western economies, an opportunity to sort of be a bit more self-determined um, in the way that they are providing for their families and achieving financial security um, is an incredible uh, impact and a way to, to and a benefit of overcoming systemic problems. So that, that would be my answer. Not bad, that's, that's great. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> All right, Neil, now, now, you, now your turn. <laughs> well, I think Courtney hinted at the, the ecological services piece, right? I know that, um, I know a story about two islands in, in the hurricane. There was Sweeting's Cay and McLean's Town, where they're right next to each other, and one of them had already cut down all their mangroves, right? And the other one had left them intact. And I heard, the, I heard this story from, from Sam Teicher, who um, heard it from people in McLean's town. But one of these communities had no deaths and very little infrastructure damage mm -hmm. because, their, because their mangroves were intact because they had maintained that ecology. And the other one was totally decimated. And so it's, it's, it's true that these mangrove systems that we're working with have a really positive externality um, and based on some articles in Manga Bay, the, the estimate of the benefits that they provide in a given year is $100,000 per acre per year, right? That's ecosystem services, which are just positive externalities, right? Unless, unless a reinsurance company wants to fund some forestry or unless we find a way on how to put a dollar price on biodiversity, um, which, it, seems like a good idea on one hand and kind of profane on the other. But um, it's through a regenerative approach and a systems thinking approach, we've got opportunities to address a Gordian knot of issues, right? It's water, it's food security, it's economy, it's carbon, it's biodiversity. Um, and, and beyond those which everybody recognizes, it's the, the concept of tying people's well-being to ecological function, right? And instead of depending on ecological degradation and, and letting that run its course to its inevitable end, right? Which, which historically has happened dozens of times in every continent with most every culture, um, if we can tie wealth to ecological function, then we lay the foundation to create permanent systems, right? Systems that can last indefinitely. And that's, um, that, that to me is the, the driving axiom. It, it's, it's the real potential of what we can do. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, Neil. And yeah, I think actually that really leads well into our, our next question, which is what roles do diversity, equity, and inclusion play in helping scale your models? Courtney, I'm going to throw it back to you. Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, diversity, equity, and inclusion are are becoming sort of like the norm rather than the exception, at least in the private sector, very much so. Um, and the idea is something that should have been a system change long ago, but we all benefit from diverse perspectives. And particularly when you're doing a community led initiative, I mean, the idea and like, I'm not Bahamian, so I don't wanna be, I would prefer not to be the face here representing the Blue Action Lab, um, but I'm here representing sort of the global model that we wanna do. And that's why we're working with Save the Bays. So Rashima Ingram who runs Save the Bays is incredible. Um, and we have a lot of really great local partners who are working on this. And the idea is really to give them a platform to tell their story because um, to Neil's point, 
there are people who have been living in the Bahamas who have experienced firsthand um, the effects of climate change. And one of the stories that Rupert Hayward, who is a, a Bahamian and who is the president of the Action Lab, um, often tells is right after Hurricane Dorian, um, they went out east and they um, were helping with the relief and they were talking to a gentleman and, and Rupert said, you know, what do you think caused this? Like, why do you think this one was so bad? And he didn't really expect an answer related to climate change at all. I mean, the Bahamas is a very conservative country and um, he just didn't expect, you know, to the answer to be right at climate change. And he said, oh, it's definitely climate change. When I was a little boy, I could cross from here into the town center along the coastline, no problem, even at king tide, which is the highest tide in the middle of the spring. And then he said, but, you know, I haven't been able to do that in decades because the beach has eroded. And so, like, if you just go into the communities and talk to people and say, like, there is no denying climate change for coastal communities. I mean, they live it. They see their homes narrowing and they see the loss of property and it affects them on a day to day basis. And I think the principles of diversity, equity and inclusion are one, getting more diverse voices into the room so you can benefit from having diverse perspectives and you can be empathetic, but also understand that there are different ways of, of understanding and tackling addressing problems. But two, there are just commonplace stories that aren't your story that can that can better prove a point and can really create sort of an authentic meaning and a, and a more personal attachment to the global issue of climate change, which makes it much more relatable for investors and much more relatable for people who um, know that they want to do something but really need to see a tangible story to understand the impact or really need to um, be able to put a face to somebody that they're helping. And so I think that's really a core uh, reason um, among many, many, many others besides besides it just being the right thing to do, um, the diversity, equity, and inclusion is so, so important as we sort of expand the, the climate sector and the advocacy in this space. Absolutely, awesome, thank you. Neil, how about you? Yeah, I think given how much we talk about biodiversity, I think it makes a really good corollary where in a functioning ecology, every single organism has its niche. And when they're in balance with each other, you've got a really beautiful and elegant system functioning. Um, we're a U.S. company, but the vast majority of our work is going to be happening across a wide array of cultures, languages, belief systems, value systems. And so the structure that we put together has to be a little bit of a chameleon uh, to be able to function across those, right? In Mexico, we're working with Catholic fishing villagers um, who are all Spanish speakers. But in Somaliland, it's with a, a tribal Muslim federation uh, that speaks Somali and, and quote the Quran all the time. And so we have to be able, we have to be flexible enough to be able to function across all these different structures. Um, and that means that we ourselves have to have experience and diversity in uh, working within these cultures, right? And so on our founding team, we speak I think 12 languages fluently. Um, and, and, you know, we've got a broad, diverse set of experiences. We have Muslims, Christians, and Jews on our founding team, which I think is really awesome. Um, but it's, it's really about how do, we, how do we function across the globe in a way that allows people to express their own culture and their own diversity um, while still having a successful enterprise. So that, that's how I think about diversity. Um, on the equity and inclusion side, I, I, th I think equity is, is quite different than diversity and inclusion, actually. I think for me, equity is about do the people in our company, do the people in that we work with, the communities that we work with and that we partner with, do they feel like they have skin in the game? Do they feel like they have ownership of the solutions that we're developing together. Um, and are our, our, our incentives aligned such that everyone's working toward a common purpose and a common goal? Uh, because if you don't have those structures set up right, and if people don't feel like they're part of that, um, if they don't feel like they have ownership, then you get a much worse result. Um, and so that's, that's how I think about those terms and what it means for us as an American enterprise that's going to have you know, offices all over the globe and deep, deep relations with 
communities that are indigenous or you know could be indigenous or that are um, generally less educated and less prosperous so that's that's one of the challenges we have with that with that issue or rather with with those sets I think either way, you know, it's it's just I, I love to say the ocean needs all the help we can get, right? And at the same time, you know, we literally can't afford to discount people and local people's expertise. And in fact, actually, again, getting back to the indigenous wisdom piece, like there's so many who know better the environments than we do, right? And so it's it's leveraging that and learning to value that as an asset rather than you know as a hindrance of someone potentially you know knowing an environment better than you do. Like no, it's it's. It, we don't have that right. This is their land, right? And, and their knowledge is so critical in this piece. And, and I, I just have really, that's been one of the greatest things I've learned as I've gotten more into the regenerative systems thinking uh, is just how valuable those stakeholders are in the equation. So really cool to see how both of you guys really leverage both sides and more importantly, are really creating that case for DEI to be such a part of this conversation. So thank you both. I have one last question and then we're gonna to go to Q&A. So if you haven't put your questions in the chat, please do. Uh, the last question is, what advice do you have for people looking to get involved in ocean and climate impact in general and may not even have a scientific background? Courtney, I'm gonna start back with you. Yeah, um, I mean, I would say for us, like reach out, go to blueactionlab.com, um, send us an email, tell us what you wanna do. Um, we are, uh, a place-based model, but we are a global community and we're always looking to partner with interesting people who are doing values aligned work. Um, we're always looking for those new innovators with new ideas. Um, if you're early stage or you don't know what you want to do, obviously the Seaworthy Collective sort of venture model is, is an ideal place to start. If you have an idea and you need a place to test it, come to us like we're right around the corner it's all in the neighborhood we have everything you would need to test and prove out those solutions um but really it's like it's it's like anything else you know just get your feet wet sorry for the bad pun um and uh and come tell us what you want to do and and the beauty of being sort of a global network um with a physical infrastructure is if you want to do something in person we have that capability and if you want to learn or you want to go somewhere else we can help you find the right fit for what it is that you want to do but the idea is really to just create a community of values aligned people and connect them with things that really excite them so that they can get more involved in climate work as well bad puns are definitely encouraged here but also community building is so important and, you know what we try to do with these events is our own community building but the whole point is that all of our communities cross pollinate i know there's quite a representation of uh, the global regeneration collab here today which neil where, where Neil and I met, um, you know, and it's it's just so important that we all, you know, are building our own communities, but are doing this collaboratively. So really great point, Courtney. Uh, Neil, how about you? You know, I think I think whatever your skill set is and whatever your interest is, there's something that you can do. Um, and that's not to, there may be a better skill set you can develop or a, a skill you can stack on what you've already got that makes you, you know, more valuable or more useful or, or allows you to have greater impact. But I mean, we've got um, Joseph Nielsen sitting in here. He's volunteering with us and helping me figure out um, foundations we can target. And, you know, I don't, I actually don't know what Joseph's skill set is. I know he's a college student, but he reached out and said, hey, I'm willing to help you guys with something. What can I do? And so I think it, it just starts with a, a willingness to help and a willingness to reach out and then Finding, finding a fit and moving on from there. Yeah, I, I can even relate that to my time at Woods Hole. <laughs> I, I literally mess, spammed like 30 different researchers before I got my break. So that's a very long story short. But uh, yeah, you know, persistence and willingness to take that leap and just know that at the end of the day, if this is something you want to be a part of, that there are opportunities there and you just have to go for it. It's, it's such a key, you know, internal barrier we put on ourselves that we think that if there's a formal opportunity, there's nothing there. But, you know, networking is such a key part of all of this, which speaking of which perfect opportunity to switch over to our Q&A and, and let other people uh, get in, in the loop here. So uh, I'm going to start, uh, by the way, you're you know more than welcome to unmute when when you're called upon. Um, so I'm going to start with Brian, who I'm going to let him have dealer's choice on questions because I saw you had two. <laughs> Brian, oh, that's you know, fine. 
I'll start with the first one. Uh, Neil and Courtney, it's great to hear about your projects and greetings from Australia, where we're working on marine permaculture from here to the Philippines. We've got some wonderful partners in the Philippines and, and Neil, your work is so inspiring. Uh, and, and they've managed to develop the seaweed farm as a marine protected area enforcement tool. And so the idea of doing the seaweed cultivation and having that those subsistence communities be the enforcement for the marine protected area is this huge synergy we're working with. The other is that we're actually addressing these nutrient value chain gaps because the oceans get warmer, they stratify in the tropics. We're getting this uh, re restoring natural over overturning. And that means we can get two to four times the seaweed production. So suddenly it's that food security, habitat, biodiversity that all comes in. Our challenge and our opportunity is to scale to the commercially sustainable hectare for seaweed communities and for um, seaweed farmer families. And so the question I would have for both of you is, what have you found to be the most effective finance mechanisms? How do we scale this? What is the transition between doing good while doing well from moving from a philanthropic activity to a commercial activity? Are there some best practices out there? Oh, you want me to go first, Courtney? I would, um, just based on what you said, it sounds like what they've established is a commons, right? They have rules of, regulating a common resource. Um, the question of how do we make this more uh, viable or more scalable, I would first look at the value chain. Is there something, if you got, uh, and it also depends on what, what the scarcity is. Is it just that you need resources to scale or is it that the, you know, the revenues per unit don't allow for scalability or, and so one thought I had was, if you, is, is there a higher value product that you could process this, this macroalgae into that would allow you to capture a higher quantity of the value chain, right? Where you're getting higher, higher revenues per unit produced? Yeah, some of the uh, food and fertilizer products like biostimulants are yeah, higher value. So, so if work. you went into the processing, it may very well that, that your economics change. Are your projects financed with um, like equity in the project or in the parent company? What what are you finding? What are the finance mechanisms? Is it equity financing or something else? We're we're um, we're explicitly turning away venture capital. Um, un unless a venture capitalist comes to me and says I'm super flexible and I don't care if we don't exit in ten years, because I don't I don't see that venture capital and regenerative enterprise match. I, I just don't think they match. Mm -hmm. um, and a great example of this is what happened with uh, Danone's CEO last week. Um, Danone's CEO has been fired because their growth in margins was lower than their competitors. That's because the CEO was focused on things like biodiversity and water, right? Right. And, and so the, the shareholders said, sorry, this isn't profitable enough for us. You're out. And so I'm, I'm really conscious about preventing us from ever being in that situation. And that means I'm not gonna 10X your money in 10 years, and I'm not gonna sell to a Nestle or a Unilever or a Cargill or whatever it may be. And so we're, um, we have a very creative financing situation that I don't wanna go into details on on this webinar, but I will say that in some cases, um, we're, we're a paid client to develop these projects. And in other cases, we're developing, we're developing them on our own and financing it ourselves through a, a very creative set of tools, um, one of which is a donor advised fund. Yeah, I mean, we've heard about those, but I think there's an opportunity for further engagement. So thank you for that. Yeah. Courtney, do you have some thoughts on this? Yeah, I do. Um, I think, look, I think a lot about sort of alternative financing models, not just in the climate community, but also more broadly, right? As we, um, the coronavirus has like decimated independent businesses. And then as we tried to get relief out to regular everyday Americans and small businesses, we had to go through large financial banks, which in the aftermath of the global financial crisis, were encouraged to absorb and scoop up community lenders who had a unique expertise in how to actually support community businesses. And then we were all surprised when large financial institutions that are for-profit institutions that make money by serving their largest clients, in fact, did just that. And they were like, well, that was against our directive. But I mean, like there are all sorts of policy reasons we can talk about why that um, was never going to work and why the surprise about it is was ridiculous 
as ridiculous as the expectation that it would go a different way. Um, we need an alternate way of funding um, businesses that don't meet the VC model. Also, like the VC model itself is bananas. Like the fact that we are going through and processing things and saying, we're going to raise a whole boatload of money and then invest it with the expectation that 90% of our investment is going to completely fail and lose, but one's going to be so big, it's going to cover the rest of it is just, it's gambling. I mean, it just is like, it's a, it's gambling with a little bit of insider research. Um, it's extractive and it's exclusive and it keeps, um, it exacerbates an income inequality problem. Um, and it's, I have a lot of issues with it. That being said, we need an alternative model that is more patient capital, that is more impact forward, um, and that incentivizes different types of investment, right? We need a model that's going to incentivize healing the planet because it's the right thing to do, because it can make better financial returns. We're seeing businesses understand now that if they don't invest in the planet, um, there won't be a planet for them to have a business. And that's a problem. So I think we're, we're starting to see more creative ideas about how to do sort of more patient capital um, and not really rely on short-termism. I think you're going to see that more from people who are geared more towards the futurism side. I actually, I mean, I think I know that's like, there's a lot going on in um, geopolitical issues right now, but like America is a very young country. Australia is a very young country. There's a lot of short-termism there. Um, and there are larger, there are other countries that are not, that are thinking more long-term and there, there are lessons to be learned from longer time horizons. I think you're gonna see a lot more creative solutions from blue carbon bonds um, and, and regenerative infrastructure. So, you know, again, like having coral reefs and mangroves insured as infrastructure and, and financed as infrastructure is gonna be a new thing that you can do. And it's gonna make financial sense. We just need the really smart people with long-termism to come up with those new products. But I think they're coming. Wonderful. Thank you. I'm learning a lot today. Uh, <laughs> and then just to add Seaworthy side too, I mean, we're, we're a hybrid for-profit nonprofit, right? So we're as much focused on social impact as we are at creating for-profit enterprises that are doing the impact, right? So, you know, there, the bottom line is we need to engage as many forms of capital as we can to get into the space and just start solving these problems. Obviously some come with more strings attached that may not be as conducive, but the bottom line is, you know, we we need to be able to have that, you know, nonprofit, you know, philanthropic piece that's accessible to, accessible to us if we're going to actually be able to finance these things because, you know, as we mentioned, the returns just aren't going to be there to support traditional investment for sure. Um, I'm going to move on because I know I know we got a lot of questions coming. Uh, Peter, I saw you asked a question. Yeah, I was just wondering if uh, if either of you has uh, gotten commitments from people to buy your carbon. So we're, we're pushing a futures deal um, on our carbon where, and there's a number of entities in that conversation. Um, the, the blue carbon world is very much in a developmental phase, but so we've talked with Vera, we've talked with Climate Action Reserve, we've talked with Conservation International um, there's a number of entities that have to be involved on this. You've got to have the right protocol established or write your own protocol. You've got to have an independent verifier of the impact of what you've done. You've got to prove what they call additionality, which means that what you're doing wouldn't have happened anyway, and permanence. And then once that's all in, then you can be issued a carbon credit and sell it to somebody. So we've been setting up that there, there's a whole chain within this, or rather a circle within this world that needs to be established before you can do it. And I've been engaging with a number of entities along the different links of that circle. Um, but I will say that we have, we've had interest from uh, one of the seven sister oil and gas companies. Um, we've had interest from the NFT world We've had interest from a Saudi te telecommunications company. Uh, and there's a lot happening here. A lot of the movements in the private markets while the public markets figure out what they're gonna do. And there's a lot of uncertainty there, but the private markets are moving quite a bit. Peter, are you interested in buying carbon? Why do you ask? 
No, I'm interested in seeing who's buying carbon. <laughs> it's a broad and expanding world. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If plants could be consumers, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we'll sell them the carbon. Yeah. yeah. Courtney, did you have something you wanted to add? <laughs> so we are, so we're in the process of, of building out a co-working space for our entrepreneurs um, and building it. And we want it obviously to be as sustainable as possible. And I came across um, a carbon negative furniture company um, that's using compressed hemp to make the furniture. And so I was like, well, this is amazing. You know, can you make us sort of tables and chairs for our co-working space? And they're prototyping right now. And they're carbon negative in their manufacturing. But she was like, look, we're going to have to, to, to truly be carbon negative, we're actually going to have to buy some carbon credits because we can't transport with and still be carbon negative. It's just impossible. And so we're seeing a number of companies like that, like art, like we're not selling any carbon because we're just a facilitator of these companies, but our companies will do that. Um, but we're seeing this sort of, demand which is like a little bit um it, it's it, it's hard to parse because you want to be able to say we're buying carbon negative furniture which we are but the company itself is not fully carbon negative because of transport costs and so in this for the sake of transparency we would say you know obviously there are some carbon credits that we need to do but the thing that we've come up with and the plans that we've we've sort of explained are you know we're doing this large scale mangrove restoration project so you as you make your carbon negative furniture and then you need to buy carbon offsets we can create those carbon offsets for you through our mangrove restoration, similar to like what Neil is talking about. And then all of a sudden you're both helping the community that you're serving and you're offsetting your carbon and maintaining your commitment to be a carbon negative company. Um, but you're doing it with a direct impact on the local community you're serving too. So it's like a nice closed loop cycle um, process. Awesome. Well, all right, we have like five minutes. I'm gonna to try to get in two more questions. Harriet, would you like to unmute? Oh, sure. Uh, I'm just interested because, you know, I know I'm going back to sort of the policy question, you know, the, in terms of policy and private investment and so forth. And I'm, I'm saying this because actually government and policymakers have an opportunity to become somewhat of a venture capitalist here or a private investor or whatever. They can motivate the market. They can I, not be reactive, but they can be proactive. So I'm just wondering if there's an opportunity here and I don't know the governments, you know, I would say, you know, US government better than others, but I think there are governments now who are interested in that being proactive space where they can be, take a leadership position and then outline for investors how to create that so-called moonshot, you know, as Kennedy said, you know, he brought together private investment. I mean, we've, we've invested five, I don't know, what is it, five, bill, five million or whatever it is in, in Tesla. I mean, you know, we can, as, you know, governments can be that leader. And I'm just wondering where, Neil, and you know, where you guys are, is there an opportunity in the governments that you're policymakers that you're in contact with to be, take on a more proactive role as an investor, as a, you know, organizing the private investment space, so to speak. Does that make sense? I hope. <laughs> What are we doing to push policies that move investors to invest in ocean? Well, in the, in the past, what? we've done that. You know, I mean, I'm going back to the 60s. So, I mean, it is a possibility. I feel like, you know, here Biden administration could be doing that. I mean, they're, they're starting to do that a little bit. But I feel like I'm wondering in, in Europe, certainly in the UK, they're starting to do that. They're starting to be, take the the policymakers are becoming, taking more of a leadership role. I know that uh, the UN named this decade, the decade of ecosystem restoration. And in the first week of June, they're actually going to roll out what that means. I know they're offering grants. I know they're offering investment. The, what the program is, is, has not been made clear in any sense of the word. So at least on the UN scale of things, there, there has been movement and it appears like there will be um, significant amount of resources available from, from the UN and the World Bank. Um, on the moving policy side of things, my, uh, as in a, at least in the United States, uh, my sense is that 
uh, policy is a lagging institution, right? B policymakers are not leaders on on what happens. They're they're laggers, right? So, right. If we want if we want U.S. policy to change, we have to win the markets first, and then policy will follow. At least in the U.S. I agree, and that it's, I think that's the problem with markets right now. They're they're the leaders, which they shouldn't be, you know. But. <laughs> It, it goes both ways, right? Because then if we do win the markets and we win the policy, it, it, right, it's right. what is the structure that we've got and that should determine what actions we take. Um, in, in Saudi Arabia, where I was, it's a totally different thing, right? Um, actually, I, I heard from someone in Saudi that my, the project I did, which was tiny, has resulted in... Um, national policy changing around deforestation. Um, wow. they, they have issued fines for cutting down every species of tree that I named in a video I released six months ago. And, and somebody told me that it was because of my video that they named those specific trees. That's I, don't, I don't know if that's true or not. I have no, <laughs> I have no way to verify it. So I'm not taking credit for it. But certainly, if, if you're in a monarchy, you can change policy dramatically easier than if you're in a democracy, right? You just got to get in the room with the right guy and tell him the right story. Whereas in the US, it's, it's just um, imposed and purposeful stagnation, right? right. Uh, so in the US, you got to focus on markets. But in Saudi, I was very much focused on getting in the room with the right people so that we could do the right kind of work. Awesome. Courtney, do you have any, anything to add to that? I, I do, and I, it's, a, it's a slightly uh, um, controversial stance, but I, my, I come from, my background is as a, an attorney. I was, an, I was a congressional investigator and I was an antitrust attorney, and then I became an anti-monopoly advocate in a past life. Um, and I would say, I would agree with Neil about winning the markets. I would just caution that the idea of winning the markets is not um, is no longer sort of a reasonable reach um, for most people because the way the markets are structured now and the way policy is made is that the markets are controlled by a few people and they determine sort of policy stuff. And so I think you saw a pushback from that of that um, sort of system in 2016 and then you saw it again in 2020. Um, and I think that and again, I'm an optimist and I'm hoping that some of the new picks like Tim Wu and Lena Khan to FTC um, will start to actually dig into how the markets are operating in the US and how people are consolidating power and therefore controlling policies as a result of their corporate power. Um, and I think until we start addressing sort of really community grassroots needs for economic opportunity. And like, I happen to be doing it in the Bahamas in a sustainability way, um, because I think it, it aligns with all of my interests. But um, more broadly, we need to be empowering communities to um, lean into their individual characteristics and rebuild their own economic destinies. And I think if we go back to that sort of premise of how do we leverage the natural resources around us to create market opportunities, which there are, and then gets policies that are already out there to support that growth, really empower the SBA, really um, create financial regulation that actually addresses the needs of communities, then you can start to build a localized market power. And then you can shift the conversation and win the new market, right? The reason the blue economy is so exciting for me is because it is an untapped market and it's undominated by monopolistic actors. We have a unique opportunity right now and in the wake of COVID to define how that market is going to be created and emerge and who's going to get to play in that. And I think if we can, if if we can take this opportunity right now, then we can sort of promote inclusive policies from the outset rather than try to reverse engineer the ones that got us to this place of like market capitalism already. So that's sort of what we're trying to do with this model. And, and to add to Courtney's case real quick, you know, why I started Seaworthy is I did actually see some of the monopoly happening in the ocean innovation space, right? I mean, I literally got bottlenecked either working in defense or work, working in oil and gas as a marine roboticist, right? I mean, so there is actually already some of that happening, but especially here in South Florida and, and Bahamas, right? Those, those organizations haven't really taken over. So there is that opportunity here and that's what's really unique. So 
uh, you know, it, it is this finite window we have to really, you know, turn, turn, turn things around, but more importantly, establish a market for sure. And yeah, great points, Courtney, really, uh, that, was, that was a hard act to follow. Um, <laughs> with all that being said, I know we're actually over time. So thank you guys for sticking around. Um, I have a quick wrap up from the Seaworthy side, but before I do that, I just want to thank Courtney and Neil again. This was an awesome panel. Really, really happy to have you guys and just incredible conversation. Really, thank you all so much. Um, and then otherwise, I just want to do a quick screen share to just let you guys know, again, what's going on right now with us at Seaworthy and what the opportunities are. And yeah, and you can see uh, if you guys want to share your info, contact info in the chat. Um, actually, I think uh, Julie is going to share some info as well. Um, but we just want to make sure you guys are aware we have our, our call for applications right now to become a co-founder of an ocean focused startup here with us through our venture studio, where we're focusing on our, our six different opportunities for sea change. Again, you can learn more on our website just right at the top. And then otherwise, uh, we're actually going to, and that's, that's the page on the website. And then otherwise on Friday of this week at two o'clock, we're going to have our next panel. Where we're actually going to dive deeper into our opportunities for sea change and have other founders who can answer your questions about what it takes to become a founder. And again, making this opportunity available and inclusive for people to really take that leap. So any other information you guys want, there's our contact info and social media. Julie is also posting that in the chat. But again, thank you all so much for coming today. Um, if you have any additional questions, feel free to reach out and follow up. And uh, you know, thanks again. Really appreciate it all. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Daniel, for putting this together. You're doing a great job with Seaworthy. Thanks, Neil. Appreciate it, man. No, you guys are you guys are great. It's, it's perfect synergy. Thanks for your presentation for today. Time. That was that was really inspiring. Thanks, Brian. Thanks Look forward to following up. Joining and thank you, Daniel, for having us. Of course, my pleasure. All right, we'll see you guys next time. Cheers. Thanks, all.